I don't know about you, but um, that update was so incredibly moving. Um, just there's so much that our church is privileged to be a part of that um, even as the pastor of our church, there's so much that often takes place that I don't know about, that I find out after the fact, because there's a lot of great, amazing things. And many of these stories I had heard of before, but hearing them again, um, man, what, what a privilege it is that we get to serve God together and that we get to serve God in a way that isn't just about us, um, that he extends his mercy, his love, his grace beyond us. Um, praise God. Could we give the Lord a hand for that? Just thank you, Jesus. We're going to go to scripture this morning. We're going to be in the gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 34. And this is the final sermon in our three-part sermon series titled Financial Freedom. And if you have not been here the previous weeks, encourage you to go to the website and check in because we have been talking about a subject that is quite important to God and quite important for us. Um, God has a lot to say about money. Um, and it, there's a reason he has a lot to say about it because unless we hear what he has to say about money, um, our hearts will remain quite heavy, bound, um, distracted, um, often preoccupied in very harmful, negative ways. But if we hear what God has to say about money, then we could experience financial freedom, true financial freedom. Let's go to scripture as we hear the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your voice frees us. It illuminates our hearts. It helps us to see reality through your eyes. And we pray that you would speak to each of us from your word. Holy Spirit, glorify Jesus, reveal him, have your way in our hearts as we go to the scriptures. And we thank you, Father, uh, for your love, your mercy, your grace. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Um, I was remembering uh, when I was uh, quite young, my mother, she had, uh, I think this, the, what's that term, uh, the statutes of limitations? 
I think she's past the point of getting arrested. She's an old woman. I don't think, I don't think the police want anything with her. She had a job off the books because um, we were on public assistance. And if you had a job, um, uh, they would take away public assistance. She's a single mother. She was just trying to navigate, taking care of my sister and myself. And she had a job at a factory, a clothing factory. And I remember going there with her, and it was quite the depressing place. I'll, I, it was distinct. I was a young kid, and I remember going in there. It was like it's just uh, poorly lit. Um, it was very dirty, um, and the conditions were not great. And yet there was just rows and rows of, uh, in particular at that time, uh, Latina mothers and women, um, and they were working and making clothing. And I remember there was just this sense of like, because I remember watching my mom make the clothing. She would take some of these things home and actually make pieces at home. And she would get paid like cents for each piece. Um, and so she would have to hustle and do a lot of them in an hour just to make that hour actually be somewhat financially worth it. Um, but the sense in that kind of environment and that kind of work was it didn't matter what you were going through. It didn't matter what your life was like and what you were carrying, whether you were sad or joyous or whether you felt hopeful or you were going through a really tough time. It didn't matter. What mattered was get the job done. You, you have a certain quota. Meet it. Um, it doesn't matter if this place is safe or well lit uh, or, or good for you in all sorts of ways, uh, you know, the fullness of your human experience. No, just get it done. And, and even to the expense of ignoring anything that you're carrying. And I think in some ways, sadly, we have a similar view of God that I think sometimes we think that God doesn't care about what's interior, that he's just like interested in like, do the right thing. And you're like, but I, God, I'm, I'm going through a lot. No, just produce, do the right thing, get it done. There's an expectation that we think that God has of us in a kind of a callous, distant way, an exacting way, but that is not the God of the scriptures. That is not how God reveals himself to us. In fact, he reveals himself to us and presents his character and his heart in a way that says quite the opposite, that actually God cares about what you're carrying in your soul. He cares about what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, He's not just exacting outside of you and saying, you better do the right thing and you better meet the standard and ignoring what's happening inside of us. So much so that here we hear the words of Jesus, the living God, the son of God, taking time to talk about the human experience of anxiety, of what's happening inside of us. And he addresses it quite powerfully. And, I'm, and I don't know about you, but given the fact that we are so prone to be anxious, that anxiety actually the world is paying more attention to it, um, it gives me great comfort to know that God has been speaking about anxiety from way before researchers and mental health counselors began to see that it was a worrisome thing, that God has thoughts and wisdom and care, and he actually sees it, he's not ignoring it, and he has something to say to us about anxiety. And today we're going to look at some of the key things that Jesus says in this passage with the prayerful expectation that if you are wrestling with anxiety, if you're carrying it, if you're experiencing it, if right now you're kind of like, hey, I parked anxiety before I came in here, but I'm going to meet it later on. It's there. And you know that just part of your life or Monday's come, it's like, I'm good. And just the mention of Monday, your, your, your spine stiffened up, that where you, you know that it's a constant thing that you're engaging with. I'm trusting that Jesus is going to speak to each of us in a way that he will resource us, empower us to have a fundamentally different experience in the life that we live because he cares about us, because he sees us, and he alone has the wisdom that we need. What you'll notice in this passage from verse 19 in particular to verse 24, that's the first section verse 19 to 24, and then the next section is verse 25 to 34. But you'll notice in the first section, verse 19 to 24, that Jesus highlights something that 
is happening all the time. It's kind of playing in the background. It's, 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 it's always at work whether we realize it or not. It's present. And that is that there is this ongoing kind of cyclical relationship between our experience of anxiety and our relationship to money. You could wake up and not be thinking about anxiety and not be thinking about money, but it's at work. It's always in the background. It's always there. And this, the cyclical relationship we see is that, in essence, if you and I have a broken relationship to money, then it starts the cycle and leads us to experience anxiety. But then, if we experience anxiety, more often than not, it feeds more into the broken relationship toward money. And it on and on and on it goes. There's this perpetual cycle that we find ourselves in. And so perhaps you're here and you're experiencing anxiety and you're thinking, I'm not anxious about money. I'm anxious about this or that. But according to Jesus, he connects anxiety in our relationship with money, which for, for us, I would invite you to kind of do some digging and, and kind of search and go to the roots. There's a great likelihood that whatever you're anxious about can be traced back to a broken relationship toward money. That they're interconnected, that one is feeding the other and making this cycle go on and on and on. But here's what's interesting. Like, like, I've read this passage so many times over the years for so many reasons. First and foremost, for my own soul, because I have uh, wrestled with anxiety for quite a bit over my life. Uh, for many years, not knowing I was anxious, because um, my whole life, everybody told me, hey, you're so, like, cool under pressure. You, you're, like, you don't react. I didn't realize I was disconnected. Of, of course I'm cool under pressure. I'm not feeling stuff. And so <laughs> I should feel. I'm not feeling it. Of course I look unperturbed. But then as I began to d dig into, oh, there's actually like a slow brewing cauldron of anxiety that's been there. And I wasn't allowed to pay attention to it or to acknowledge it because in my neighborhood growing up, if you were anxious, you got eaten up. They, they, they devoured you. They, you were prey. And so you learn to not show fear, to not show concern. But then as I mature, as a follower of Jesus, and then as I grow as a husband and father, it, it came to the surface and it became undeniable that there's a lot of brewing anxiety. And so I've gone to this passage for wisdom, for healing, for hope, but also as a pastor. I've gone to this passage quite a bit because... Anxiety is something that I have had to walk with people through quite a bit. If you're feeling anxious or wrestling with it and you feel alone because other people aren't putting those cards on the table, let me set you free and tell you that, that the people here in this room, people in your life that look like they never have an anxious moment, they do. And given a safe space, they let it out. They let it know, like you are not alone. If you feel like you're carrying this alone, you're not. We're all dealing with it. But even with my familiarity with this passage, it sh something struck me this time around that has been really profound. And I want to share that with you. Again, if you read verse 19 to 24, Jesus is saying, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust uh, don't destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal, for where your treasure is there your heart will be also. Then he gives us this like kind of cryptic poetic language. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, which we don't have time to unpack it, but essentially he's saying the way you see the world, your eye, your view of the world, if it's, uh, if it's an orientation toward light, then it causes everything to be seen in light of God's reality. If it's an orientation or perspective that's rooted in darkness, it infects everything. And then he gets to verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Now, this is intense kind of battle talk. This is like, like war talk. You can't serve two masters. You either will love the one or hate the other. And then he tells us the two masters 
that we are constantly having to choose who we're going to bow our heart to. He could have said a lot of things. He could have said, no one can serve God in Rome. That would have been applicable at that time. Could have said, no one can serve God and your ethnic identity. Could have been applicable. Sometimes our ethnic identity, we put it before our identity in God. And, and, and we put God in second or third place. He could have said a lot of things. But he chose specifically to say the one thing that if he addresses that, it actually touches on identity, Rome, all these other things. He says, you cannot serve God and money. Did you know that the primary thing that's trying to steal your affection and mine away from God is money? How we relate to it, how we see it, how we manage it, how we steward it, how, the way it occupies space in our life, it is the number one competitor for the space in our hearts whether we will serve God or not. It's mind-blowing. Jesus is concerned for people in who they serve. He didn't say you cannot serve God in false doctrine. I would think he would have really thought about false doctrine as like a real competitive thing, a false view of God. And that's important. And he addresses that in other places. But right now, he, like with such clarity, he says, if you want to identify the primary enemy that is trying to steal your affections and your allegiance from God, he lets us know what it is. It's money. But here's the thing that was mind-blowing to me. Verse 25. After he says that, then he says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. This shouldn't have been such a revelation because the rules of grammar should have dictated to me that therefore should have drawn my attention and say, what's the therefore, therefore? That's a rule of grammar. And yet, this time around, it was like I never saw the therefore. But now I saw the therefore. And now as I see the therefore, I said, what's the therefore, therefore? And it's before Jesus says, therefore, don't be anxious, he takes time to give us a new relationship with money. And here is the thing that I think is important for us to wrestle with and so uh, like eye-opening for me, realizing that we think anxiety is circumstantial. But Jesus says anxiety is rooted to a broken relationship we have with money. And that's why you can wake up on a beach with all your bills paid for, the resort taken care of, everything good, and the first thing that you wake up with is an anxious thought. That's why good, life could be good. I've known folks that have gotten promotions and everything is good, really great week, and we're like, hey, how you doing? Congratulations. Like, do you know it could all crash? You know, like it's, it's not circumstantial. Circumstances would dictate you shouldn't have anxiety. But often we do, even in the midst of good circumstances, it's because Jesus is letting us know that if we don't deal with our relationship with money, anxiety is always brewing. And it's going to show up in the least beneficial times. You know, I, I have a friend was sharing with me um, that his son, uh, they live in a really nice neighborhood. I was shocked to hear this. Um, it wasn't like, like a, a tough inner city space. And his son ends up getting um, involved with the Bloods. This kid grew up in church, really good young man, promising future. And he ends up getting pulled into one of the more violent gangs that we know of. And there's something about those gangs that um, really is just awful. And that if you want to leave, they jump you out. And so you can't just leave and say, hey, I'm done. I want a different path for my life. They're like, okay, good. We'll see you on Friday. And they beat you, sometimes to the, close to death. And then after that, you're good. I've talked to people in that situation. 
the most anxious thing for them is the period of time after they tell them, hey, I'm out, and before they're jumped out. Because they know it could happen anywhere. They could be at the parking lot of a, of a shopping center. They could be exiting work. They could be coming out there. It could happen anywhere. And they're living with this constant anxiety over them. That is what Jesus is kind of describing, that if we don't have a, a, a healthy, different relationship toward money, we will always live under the threat of anxiety. It's always going to be around. It's always going to be ready to pounce on us. And so what does Jesus do? He gives us a different way of living, one where trusting in money is not at the core of our existence, where our identity is not rooted and based on money, how much we have, how much we think we have, what it allows us to have. He gives us a different way of living. It, he invites us to live without money being the primary foundation for our soul's well-being. In essence, he, he invites us to live an anxiety-free life. Doesn't that sound amazing? An anxiety-free life. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. And if you're like me, you hear that and there's like, that sounds great, but I'm, I don't know if I, that's a struggle to believe. That's a struggle to hold on to. But that's what Jesus is inviting us into, to live a life where anxiety doesn't rule and reign. And how does he do that? What's necessary? What's necessary? is for us to see the world the way Jesus saw the world. Jesus saw the world in a way that's very different than the way you and I tend to see it, in that he saw the world as a place of abundance. Jesus saw the world, and mind you, he's not seeing it as like a distant observer. He's seeing it as the one who created it. He knows the, the universe that he created, he knows its capacity, he knows its potential, and he sees the world rightly. He sees the world as a place that he designed with the capacity to meet the needs of his children in all creation. That's how he engineered the world. He engineered the world in a way where, as he mentions, birds of the air get taken care of. Flowers of the field get taken care of. He's describing a universe that he created, that the needs of created things are met by the inherent abundance that he designed in the system. When you read the words of Matthew 6, where he begins to describe, like, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. And he says, look at the birds. And he, and he draws our attention to the way the creator takes care of his creation. This is an echo of words that are found in Psalm 104. Hear these words. Psalm 104, verse 10. God describing his creation, his, the work of his hands, says, you make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly. The cedars of Lebanon that he planted in them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night. When all the beasts of the forest creep about, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and hide down in their dens. Verse 23, man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. God created 
the world that we live in with the capacity to provide what we need. And so when he says, don't worry about what you need, this is part of the reason why he's saying, don't worry, because he's saying, I know what I created. And I know I created the world to be able to provide what you need. And so in other words, he's saying, this is why you shouldn't worry, because what you need has already been created. I created it. It exists. You may have to go work for it. You may have to cultivate it. You may have to seek it out. But it's there. I created it. And so this frame of seeing the world that we see in Psalm 104 is carried over into the frame that Jesus puts forth as this, the basis of an anxiety-free life. Where he says, you and I could live free from anxiety if we trust in his design for the world. In other words, God is an incredible host, and he invited us to a party that he assures us will never run out of food and drink. This analogy was really helpful. I, I heard it from um, this Bible expositor, Tim Mackey. He's involved in the Bible Project, and they have a really great podcast. And he talked about God being a host, that he's hosting his children in the world. And as a good host, what does a good host do? A good host anticipates the needs of their guest and makes sure that while you're there, essentially you want for nothing. God created the world for us, his children, and he's hosting us and he promises as our host, as our father, as our provider, that everything we need will be available to us. Contrary to the, other, the, the unfortunate experience, if you've ever gone to a party, a celebration, where the host didn't think through things, or maybe you have hosted parties, and maybe you didn't think through things, isn't that awkward? Or it's just like, oh, you didn't eat? Go get, oh, there's no food? Oh, there's no plates? Oh, you want to, oh, there's no forks. Okay, okay. Oh, you're third, oh, oh he's, he's choking, get him some, oh, there's no water. There's no, somebody pat his back, you know, like he's going to die. You know, he's, it, the, the awkwardness of you didn't host well. You didn't think through uh, where you're there in the party. Have you ever seen people anxious in a party? I've seen it. Where it's just like, they ain't enough food. These people don't plan well. They run to the food. They're just like, I got to get mine first because nobody, you know. It, anxious people at a party is a fun thing. I people watch. And so it's just like, man, you've been to parties where you were left out. That's why you're getting yours. And so uh, first in the line, make sure and now they can relax. That's how some of us live with respect to our view of God. We think he's running out of provision. We think that we better hurry up and get what we can. And then when we get what we can, we hoard and we hide it. And one of the big reasons, one of the big barriers toward being generous, and it's something we've talked about in this series, is not whether you have a lot of money or not, is whether you have a lot of anxiety with respect to your money. Because if you are anxious with respect to your money, you will always be fraught with the fear there won't be enough. And if I give what I have, I will be wanting. But if God is your host, if he is our provider, and he tells you to be generous, even if money left your hands, it won't leave your life. Because your father will make sure you have what you need. So unless we get this perspective, generosity, the kind of justice that Donald talked about, the, the opportunities to use our resources as stewards to honor God, as tools to advance his kingdom, will always be spiritually difficult, like awful kind of heart moments because... We will always be faced with the fear, will there be enough? But we're being told there will be enough. 
God designed our world where there will be enough. So what does he do for us as we close? What is God's solution for our upside down hearts? For hearts that are prone to be anxious financially. For hearts that often doubt, will God host me? Will he provide for me? Will he take care of my needs? Will I have to hoard and hide and, and, and be tempted toward ignoring the needs of others? Will I live with the constant weight and pressure on my, on my mind that there won't be enough? God has a solution, and his solution is the cross of his son. That through the cross, he has the power to reverse how we see the world and how we see ourselves and by, by experiencing that, we can receive freedom from the anxiety-laden relationship with money that we often find ourselves in. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14 to 19 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Money will always register as a high anxiety thing in our life until we recognize something is more valuable than money. And what the scriptures tell us, two things from God's perspective that are more valuable than money is the precious blood of his son that was poured out for the second thing that's more valuable than money, you and I. Do you realize how valuable you are that the Son of God poured out his life for you and me? You know, like, that should make you walk with your head up. That should incur, like, that should orient your heart and remind you, how could a God who provided this kind of lavish, sacrificial love ever leave me wanting, ever forget about me, ever leave me stuck how could that kind of a God not provide everything we need when we see the value of the sacrifice of Jesus and esteem it as higher than money? It says you weren't ransomed by perishable things like silver or gold. You and I were ransomed through the precious blood of Jesus. When we see the sacrifice of Jesus as the most valuable thing in the universe for all time, and then recognize that what was, what was given and paid for our freedom. You know, if, if right now, if I was talking to my son, we were looking at this verse, and I said, how crazy would it be if someone said, they took your sneakers and said, these are mine unless you pay me a million dollars. It was like, I wouldn't pay it because it's not worth it. But you and I were, pay, were taken ransomed, bound. And God said, there is no price I'm not willing to pay. I will pay the highest price that's ever been paid because my children are worth it. And he paid for our freedom through the sacrifice of his son. If you've wondered how valuable you are, let that settle it forever. You're that valuable to God that he paid the highest price imaginable. And the next time you worry if God will provide for you, remember what he was willing to pay to set us free. When that hits our souls, more and more will the weight of finances being our master, being our oppressor, being the thing that we, that we serve, Rather than serving God, we will walk in greater freedom from that more and more and more.
Could I invite us to stand as the worship team comes forward? In these next few moments, I want to invite you to do some wrestling in your heart with the Lord over your relationship with money, over your relationship with anxious thoughts and feelings about money. Um, Invite the Lord to just speak to your heart, to help you see how valuable he sees you, how much he loves you, how faithful he is, how much of a good host he is to his children, that we can trust that we will have what we need, that he will provide it. Lord Jesus, would you speak to us now? And in these next few moments, as the prayer team is in the back, and they're available to pray for anything you need prayer for, and in particular the words that were shared, I want to encourage you, before we rush out, hopefully you join us for our meal, but before we do anything, let's, let's meet God right now. Let's seek him right now, right where you're at. Could we raise our hands in the presence of God and allow the Holy Spirit to meet us right now? Jesus. If you would like prayer, you can exit out of your row and go to the back. The prayer team is waiting. They would love to pray with you. Jesus. And even right there in your row, if you're sitting next to someone that you know or maybe you introduce yourself, turn to one another and pray for each other in these next few moments as we respond to God's invitation to anxiety-free living. Let's worship him.